So, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. My uh, courtesies to the members of the uh, legal uh, legal network for to all our participants and everyone who are joining joining us today. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and good morning. Again, I am uh, Abdul Jabbar Guru and I'll be presenting to you on behalf of the member of the parliament, attorney Maisara Dandaman Latif, the legislative process or the procedure in the approval of bills in the Bangsamoro government, as well as uh, citizens' participation and its importance. Now, before I begin the presentation, allow me to state a few observations and to clarify certain matters regarding the procedure in the approval of bills. The uh, process, yung proseso po ng pag-aproba ng isang panukalang batas o bill sa Bangsamoro Parliament ay halos kapareho ng proseso ng pagpasa ng batas sa Kongreso. Of course, uh, obviously, ang kaibahan ay eh, wala pong uh, upper house at lower house sa Bangsamoro Parliament at uh, meron pong konting uh, kaibahan. Pero in general po, alos magkapareho lamang sila. Minarapat ko po na sabihin nito para mapanatag ang ating kalooban dahil uh, karamihan sa ating mga kababayan ay nag-aakalang komplikado ang proseso ng pagpasa ng batas sa Bangsamoro dahil ito ay sumusunod sa parliamentary system. Okay, so let's start with the kinds of bills. Next slide, please. How is bill introduced in the parliament? Paano po ba at sino ang nag-introduce ng bill sa Bangsamoro Parliament? Malalaman po natin yan sa pamamagitan ng uh, pag-aaral kung, an kung ano-ano ang uri o klase ng bills. What are the kinds of bills in the Bangsamoro Parliament? Meron po tayong tatlo. Andiyan po ang private bill, cabinet bill, at committee bill. Ito po ay classified into three based on who filed it. So base po sa nag-file o nag-introduce. Next slide please. So Ito po ang private member bill. So ang meaning po ng isang private bill o private member bill, ito po yung unang uri, ay it is a bill presented by any member of the parliament who does not hold an executive position. So based on the definition, if the member of the parliament who filed the bill does not hold an executive position, the bill is considered private. Next slide, please. Now we have a cabinet bill. A cabinet bill is a priority measure submitted by the chief minister and the cabinet members. So if a bill is filed by the chief minister and the cabinet ministers, it is a cabinet bill. So you may ask, aside from the uh, difference between the person who filed the bill, what is the significance of uh, having this distinction? Well, cabinet bills are uh, usually prioritized. Usually, po, a cabinet bill is accompanied by a certification. The chief minister will certify to the necessity of the in immediate enactment of the bill. Pag certified po yan, the parliament has to expedite its passage. Now, unlike cabinet bills, private bills usually have no certification to that effect. Hence, its passage will not be as fast as the cabinet bill. Now, let's move on to a committee bill. We have uh, different committees. In the parliament, we have the Committee on uh, Labor and Employment, 
Committee on Public Works, etc. The committee has its own members. And if the members decide to draft a bill and file it, that is called a committee bill. Now let's move on to resolution. Next slide, please. So, ito po yung palagi nating nakikita. Members of the parliament usually file a uh, lot of resolutions. In fact, uh, last year, MP Attorney Maisara has filed almost 40 resolutions. So, what are the types of resolution? So, according to the rules, we have an ordinary resolution. It is a document that expresses the BTA's sentiments or opinions. It does not create or modify a law. Usually, nababasa natin yung mga resolutions, for example, entitled a resolution commending Mr. Ahmad Rashid for his valuable contribution in a particular endeavor or a, a resolution expressing condolences. And there are also resolutions which calls for uh, an investigation or inquiry in aid of legislation. MP Maisara has filed a resolution urging the appropriate committee to conduct investigation in aid of legislation. Yeah. Alleged anomalies, so-called social amelioration program or SAP. So my alleged anomalies, the distribution involving a certain official, so MP Mai, filed a resolution and pending po ito sa Committee on Social Welfare and Development. And should they act upon it, there will be an investigation similar to what usually happens in the Senate, wherein they invite resource persons and ask them questions in order to elicit information that could help them pass laws that will enhance the system or existing laws or laws that will prevent the occurrence of similar instances. Next slide, please. Now, we have another type of resolution. It is called a joint committee resolution. It is a resolution of two or more committees expressing the will or action of the members on certain matters. This requires the majority vote from all the committees involved. Now, I must say that this type of resolution po is rare. In fact, I haven't heard of a resolution of the same type passed by the parliament. But anyway, we have this in the rules. Now, before we move on to the next topic, allow me to briefly discuss how a resolution is adopted since it is different from a bill, which we will discuss uh, later on. Okay? So, in the case of a resolution, a member of the parliament files it and it is included in the order of business. Now, when the majority floor leader reads the title of the resolution, he usually decides on how to classify or treat the resolution. For example, the majority floor leader could say that uh, move that this resolution be the big old. Now, if it is not a simple resolution, meaning it is a complex one. The majority floor leader would usually refer the same to appropriate committees. For example, if we have a resolution referring to environment, the majority floor leader will refer it to the Committee on Environment and Natural Resources, since they are presumed to know more about the substance of the resolution. The committee will study it and they will come up with a committee report before it is sent back to the plenary. However, in the case of uh, simple resolutions, 
like commending a certain person, expressing sentiments and opinions, condolences and the likes. It can be adapted the very day it is included in the business of the day. Now, let's move on to our main topic. How laws are made in the Bangsamoro Parliament. So like I said earlier, it is almost similar to the procedure and process observed in the Congress. Next slide, please. So let's say a bill has been drafted. Nasulat na. Then it was filed at the Secretary General's office. Then it was included in the order of business. What will happen next? No? Now, now, under the Bangsamoro Organic Law, no bill shall become a law in the Bangsamoro Autonomous Region in Muslim Mindanao unless it has passed three readings on separate days and printed copies thereof in its final form have been distributed to members of the parliament three days before its passage, except when the chief minister certifies to the necessity of its immediate enactment to meet a public calamity or emergency. So ang bill ay kailangang dumaan sa three readings. At sa bawat reading po, for example, sa first, second, and third reading, ay may kaakibat na proseso na inoobserba ng ating mga mambabatas. So, sa first reading, or first stage po, the bill is introduced in the plenary. The Secretary General reads the proposed bill's number, title, and the name of the author. So, babasahin lang po ang number title at pangalan ng author. Next slide, please. Now, moving on to the second reading. When the bill is calendared for second reading, what happens is that uh, the proponent or the principal author will deliver his or her uh, sponsorship speech containing the general principles, outline, objectives, and purposes of his or her bill. So the author will usually explain why the bill should be enacted. Now before the second stage, the bill will also be scrutinized and debated upon. No? But the clarificatory questions are limited to general principles. Hindi po line by line yung mga tanong. Kaya minsan, you will witness debates in the plenary during the second week. Now, after the bill is approved on second reading, the bill is referred to the appropriate committee. What is the appropriate committee? So, for example, MP Maisara filed a bill creating the Ranao Development Authority. It is a bill that seeks to create a government agency that will rehabilitate or protect the lake, Lanao. So this has something to do with environment. So it will then be referred to the Committee on Natural Resources and Environment because its members focuses on matters relating to environment. So the appropriate committee in this case, or for that kind of bill, is the Committee on Natural Resources and Environment. And marami po tayong uh, statutory and parliamentary committees. Okay, so let's say that a bill has been uh, referred to a proper or appropriate committee. What will happen at the committee stage? According to the rules, the concerned committee deliberates in detail and line by line the legislative proposal and recommends amendments to the proposal before refer reporting to the plenary. So at the committee level, a scrutiny takes place. And if the committee wishes to introduce amendments, 
they can. No? They may do so. Now you may ask, are there public consultations made on the bill introduced? No? The answer is, it depends. If the bill seeks to meet a public calamity or emergency, there will be no consultations ordinarily. For example, a bill was passed just this year appropriating the sum of 50 million to purchase oxygen tanks to be distributed to hospitals. Now, since there is a pandemic and people infected will uh, die without this oxygen, and it is of public knowledge, the bill's enactment was fast track. Okay? Now, as for other bills, a public consultation can take place either before a bill is filed or when the bill is at the committee level. For example, a member of the parliament wants to file a bill and she first conducted a public consultation on his or her own to consult the people who will be affected by the bill and also the experts on the subject matter. You know? So take the case of uh, the RDA, the bill that uh, seeks to create the Ranao Development Authority. So before MP Maisara filed the bill which seeks to create the Ranao Development Authority, she conducted two public consultations. She invited uh, experts and uh, CSOs. One group she invited was the SALAM group. SALAM stands for uh, Save Lake Lanao Movement. No? So it is a CSO that has been actively advocating for the protection of the Lake Lanao for decades. So MP Mai invited the representatives. She also invited officials of Laguna Lake Development Authority, the academe, the dean of MSU Forestry, fishery expert, LGUs, etc. So the two public consultations was conducted prior to the filing of the bill or before it's, it is filed. So this conducted, so we can have a uh, uh, evidence no, that will support the bill. Now, a public consultation or public hearing can be called upon by the committee itself for the bills referred and pending before it. So a public consultation can also be conducted after it has been filed no? or the bill is filed. So at present, there are many bills filed in the parliament which seeks to create hospitals or establish hospitals in the Bangsamoro region. Now they are pending before the Committee on Health. And the committee is planning to conduct public consultation on each of those bills. They will uh, invite doctors to ask them appropriate number of bed capacity, what are the facilities needed, the strategic area where the hospital should be built, etc. They will also invite the residents for the public here. So let's move on to the consideration and deliberation stage. Now, we learned that after the second stage, it will be referred to the appropriate committee. Now, the appropriate committee will prepare a committee report, which will be submitted to the parliament. So what happens in the consideration and deliberation stage? The members of the parliament can now debate on the committee report, including uh, proposed amendments, except when the proponent has already agreed to adopt the committee amendment. So, titingnan kung ano ang mga binago ng committee and if nag-agree ang lahat, wala nang debate. However, if there are different views and they are irreconcilable and the view adopted by uh, both parties are uh, non-negotiable, they will divide the House and the amendments will be voted upon. 
So both the committee amendments and uh, individual floor amendments shall be debated and voted upon. Next slide, please. Okay. Now let's move on to the third reading. So we have this so-called final stage where final debate on whether or not to pass the bill is had. And the rule is that no amendment can be considered at this time. So ang nangyayari po sa third reading ay ang pagboto. So they usually cast their votes. Now, in the approval of bill, the speaker and the chief minister will sign the printed form of the approved bill. Under the Bangsamoro Organic Law, the speaker of the parliament shall also submit to the president and to the Congress of the Philippines a certified copy, a certified true copy of all laws and resolutions approved by the parliament. Now, as to the effectivity, the laws shall take effect 15 days following its complete publication in a regional newspaper of general circulation. Yun po yung uh, version na nakalagay sa BOL. Regional newspaper of general circulation. So yun po ang nangyayari sa first, second, and third reading. And that's how laws are made in the Bangsamoro Parliament. Now let's move on to another topic. Next slide, please. The role of uh, the civil society organization in the Bangsamoro legislation. Now, civil uh, society organizations play multiple roles. They are an important source of uh, information for both citizens and government. They monitor government policies and actions and hold government accountable. They engage in advocacy and offer alternative policies for government, the private sector, and other institutions. Allow me to give you an example based on observation on how important the role of CSOs uh, has been for the Bangsamoro. So you all remember the Marawi siege, which caused massive displacement. Naalala po natin yung uh, Marawi siege, which caused massive displacement. Now, the Senate formed a special committee to investigate in aid of legislation because of the alleged delay for years in the implementation of the programs and projects for Marawi rehabilitation. The Bangsamoro government also formed its own special committee to look into the status of the Marawi rehabilitation. Now, public consultations were conducted left and right, and most of the resource persons were representatives of civil society organizations. Now, as a witness to those public consultations, I could say that without the civil society organization, we will never have a full picture or a bird's eye view of what was happening at that time. It was uh, amazing how they know very well how the government in charge of uh, implementing the projects uh, for Marawi rehabilitation operates. It turns out that they insisted that they be allowed to monitor the activities of the government such that they are invited in most of the meetings of the agencies in charge. No? What an uh, initiative of uh, the internally displaced person, which mostly concerns their own personal experience. Of course, they are very important because they are evidence. But the information from the CSOs are kind of synthesized and can be quickly formulated into solutions. The information elicited from the CSOs help the members of the parliament to shape the support that they should give to the internally displaced person. So uh, there are a lot of uh, realization. Some of them were uh, reg uh, realizations regarding the uh, 
contribution of the CSO and the role. No? So we have here social accountability. No? CSOs hold other organizations accountable for their actions or inaction. Social accountability prizes transparency and honesty and make sure everyone from government officials to local school children follows the same rules. They also empower communities. Civil society organizations give voice to the disorganized, voiceless segment of society. They raise awareness of social issues and advocate for change, empowering local communities to develop new programs to meet their own needs. And also, they ensure good governance. Civil society works hand in hand with the government, striving to develop policy and implement new strategies. And beyond that, civil society builds so-called social capital by providing a way for participants to build relationships and make connections based on their values, behaviors, and beliefs. So we can say that CSO are catalysts in ensuring governance, good governance, social accountability, and empowering communities. Now let's move on to citizens' participation and its importance. Citizens' participation refers to citizen involvement in public decision-making. In uh, different interpretations, citizens may be either individuals or organized communities, and participation may involve either observation or power. And the purpose of uh, citizen participation include communicating information, developing uh, relationships, developing the capacity to act, and preserving or changing conditions. Now, citizens can exercise different amounts of power in engaging in these purposes. And the means of citizen participation include groups and formal organizations, meetings, inquiries, action, and technical assistance. Now, what is the importance of citizens' participation? We heard the saying, two heads are better than one. Well, if anything embodies this motto, it is active participation. You know? So, sabi nila, who knows better? about governance, social de development, the environment experiencing it. Sometimes the builders, designers, and architects in society get blinded by their vision and need to consider the viewpoint of those on the outside, just like any situation. So it plays an important role in the decision-making process by improving decisions through a collection of considerations among local knowledge. Now, in accordance with the uh, guide uh, questions, no? let's move on to education and promoting participation in the policy and in the policy and legislative process. How to educate and promote participation and legislative process? And I must say that uh, the following mechanisms can be applied to both education citizens about or educating the citizens about the role of parliament and uh, promoting opportunities for citizens to participate in the legislative process. So what are these uh, mechanisms? You know, number one is awareness raising programs and campaigns. No? So parliament can undertake awareness raising campaigns to educate citizens on the function of parliament and expose them to existing participation mechanisms and or promote participation in a specific process. And this can include uh, print or online advertisements through traditional or social media or by 
mailing flyers, or other documentations. Campaigns can also be established in collaboration with civil society organizations. So under the awareness raising programs and campaigns, we have the following. For example, we can have a parliament week, you know, uh, annual festival that engages people from across the country with the parliament and encourages them to get involved or events organized by the parliament and the uh, NGOs and CSOs. Or uh, we can also have awareness raising on uh, awareness raising on new laws. So activities such as workshops, seminars, public hearings, and in-person meetings organized by the uh, government agencies to disseminate information on new laws. And uh, we can also have, uh, we can also create a citizen participation office and communication departments. No? So a citizen participation office or communication department can have various mandates from educating uh, citizens on the role of the parliament to disseminating information on the work of the parliament and collecting direct input from citizens into legislative process. So we can have a parliamentary unit that provides information on the legislature and its work, as well as promote spaces for dialogue with citizens. So parliamentary office with a mandate to inform citizens on uh, parliamentary functions and processes and channel citizen participation through legislative proposals, opinions, requests, etc. Another thing is uh, we can also have the parliamentary website. You know, we can also, and we have this in the BARM and the PTA as a hub of information. You know? Parliament uh, websites can include a section to educate citizens about their role, uh, work, and impacts on citizens, as well as another explaining the mechanism by which citizen can participate in the legislative process. So parliament can also advertise these pages online and through social media to attract visitors. So we can have website explaining the legislative process. And the role of key government and parliamentary. Yung mga web pages po na yun, uh, presenting the function and the history of the parliament educational resources, activities for youth and for teachers, and the description of ways through which citizens can participate in the legislative process can help awareness uh, raising programs and campaign, or is included in the uh, awareness and raising programs campaign. Another thing, we can... Uh, we also have these education programs for children and youth. You know? So learning about the role and value of parliament at an early age can uh, prepare children and youth to become politically active citizens. You know? Such programs can be virtual or in person and include interaction with parliamentarians, uh, game, games, Simulations of uh, parliament prices and interactive materials tailored for children and youth. And uh, we, can all, we also have uh, to support the work of independent civil society organizations. So parliamentarians can contribute to building a strong and independent civil society by promoting and supporting the work of civil society organizations. So these are just among the many mechanism in order to educate and or promote participation in the legislative process. And finally, we have uh, developing engagement strategy. So how will uh, the civil society organization develop their engagement 
strategy with the Bangsamoro Parliament on poli policy issues and proposed legislation. Now, we have uh, to build recognition. You know? So you have to create an enabling environment for uh, CSO Engage. For example, uh, advocating for CSO engagement in uh, research and innovation, targeting policymakers or members of the parliament, work with media, communities, and uh, like-minded like -minded, uh, CSOs to create public awareness on the role of the CSOs. You can also demand the inclusion of CSOs in uh, regional priority seating processes and uh, ensure the role of CSOs in uh, uh, the regional policies and strategies. You can also develop partnerships and alliances. You know? Engage with uh, stakeholders and establish networks and partnerships with CSOs. And with the government, academe, and other research organizations, private sectors, respecting good partnership principles. You can also strengthen your uh, capacity, and this is a must. No? You have to build your own institutional uh, human resources, uh, develop institutional governance policies, structures and procedures for research and knowledge management. And of course, uh, securing funding you know, and advocate for more funding to be made available for CSOs, establish appropriate financial management systems and participate in calls for proposal along or in association with the academic institutions. And uh, finally, uh, these C CSOs uh, should monitor the progress, your progress. So you can always evaluate your success, uh, identify and apply indicators to evaluate the outputs, outcomes, and impact of research and uh, CSO engage, engagement in research. So with that, thank you very much. And uh, wassalam.